So did you guys survive the storms last night? (laughs) Lil and I woke up and went outside and was like, it looks like it rained last night. So we apparently slept through the whole thing. I get here and everybody's telling me how it was crazy. Uh, We didn't even know, but that's all right. So a couple of years ago, Lil and I got to go sailing on a catamaran. It's the first time in a number of years that I've gotten to do that. And I just love everything about boats. I love big boats and little boats and whatever kind of water. But there's something unique about sailing. There's something that feels so freeing because all you hear is just the wind blowing through the sails. And so we got to do that. It was awesome. But when we first started out from the dock, the captain was running the boat under its own power. And so we kind of, you know, went slowly out until we got into the open ocean. But once we got out in the open ocean, the captain gave the, the order to his assistant and the assistant went and put those two sails up. And as soon as he did that, man, the boat just leapt forward and the captain turned off the motor and we were now being powered by the wind and we were going way faster than we could go under the boat's motor. And what was really cool is we were sailing along the coast and the wind was actually blowing in towards the beach. So it was coming in from the starboard side. That's that's the way we people of the ocean say it. But uh, for you land lovers, it was coming from the, the right side of the boat. But what's cool is even with it coming from the side, they could still sail really fast uh, with that wind. Uh, an experienced crew can actually sail with wind coming any direction, even head on. Now, that's the hardest wind to sail with because you have to do something called tacking, which means you just kind of zigzag back and forth, and you're generally making your way towards the wind, but you can't sail directly into the wind. So for about an hour and a half, man, we're just having a great time, but all of a sudden our sailing adventure came to an end. We realized the boat had stopped. We were just kind of sitting in the water with rocking back and forth with the waves, and we realized the wind had died. The, the boat can sail with wind coming any direction, but when the wind dies and there's no wind, you can't sail anymore. And so the, the captain, he had to turn the boat's engine back on, and we just then kind of went much slower uh, with the boat's own power. Well, uh, we're in our third week of our sermon series called Grace in Action, where we're studying through this book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians is actually a letter written by the Apostle Paul uh, to a church in Ephesus. And at the time Paul wrote this letter, he was actually under house arrest in Rome. And he writes this letter to a church that he actually knows very well because he had brought the gospel to them the first time and started the church there 11 years before. And then he'd gone back a couple of years later and actually pastored the church for about three years. So Paul is writing to a group of Christians that he knows very well. And it's important to understand that the first three chapters is really the first half of Ephesians is broken down into what God has done for us. In other words, the grace that we have received from God. And then the second half that we'll start next week starts to talk about how do we respond to that grace? How do we respond to what's been done for us by how we live our lives and how we share grace to the people around us? And and I love how this letter of Paul is organized, where each section builds on the section before. So the first week we talked about who we are in Christ, what our identity is, that because we are in Christ, there's some things that are true about us. We are chosen. We are forgiven. We're set free. We're loved so much that we're adopted into the family of God. And then last week we talked about how that common identity of being in Christ causes us to live as a group of Christians or as a church, how we should be more unified by the one thing that we have in common, that we are in Christ, than all of the things that separate us, all our differences. And then today, Paul is going to offer up this prayer for this church in Ephesus. Before he transitions to behavior, he's going to offer up this prayer that, that they would understand how deep God's love is and the power that they've been given. And he does that because next week, the rest of the second half, he's going to start talking about how we live. And what Paul has been saying is that you can't put the cart before the horse. I'll give you an East Texas term there. That you can't put the cart before the horse. We don't behave just because. Our identity drives how we behave. In other words, our behavior is a natural result of who we are. And so we live in obedience to Christ because of our identity in him and how much we are loved by God. All right, well, let's dive into chapter three. This is Ephesians three. We're going to start with verses one through six. 
For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is, the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly. In reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. So Paul starts off this letter, or this part of the letter, by saying that he is a prisoner of Jesus. Now think about that. When Paul wrote this letter, he was a prisoner of Rome, he was under house arrest. So during the day, he could roam freely around the house, but at night, he was actually chained to a Roman guard to make sure that he didn't try to escape. But Paul doesn't say, I'm a prisoner of the Roman Empire. He says, I'm a prisoner of Jesus. Because of who Jesus is, because of what Jesus has done, because of the great love he has for him, Paul says, I'm a prisoner. I have no choice but to live for Jesus. And and so you have to understand that even when Paul was in prison, he was sharing the gospel. He wrote three books of the Bible during this period of time that he was in house arrest there in, in Rome. Actually, four books of the Bible. And these books of the Bible are still impacting people 2,000 years later. Paul says he doesn't have a choice to do that because he is a prisoner of Jesus. Because of the grace and the love that he's received from Jesus, he now lives that out as a prisoner of Jesus. In other words, how he lives flows naturally out of who he is. All right, look at verses 7 through 12. He says, I became a servant of the gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. His intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus, our Lord. In him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. So Paul starts off by saying how he was changed by the grace and the power of God. He's reminding these Ephesians of his past because before Paul wrote one-third of the New Testament, before he was the greatest missionary of all time, Paul had a different name. His name was Saul. And Saul was a Jewish official whose job was to stamp out this new Christian movement, to destroy the church. And so what Paul would do is Paul would travel from city to city with a group of people. He would arrest Christians. He would beat Christians. And sometimes he would even have them killed. And so Paul is on his way to a city called Damascus where he's going to do that again. He's going to arrest Christians in Damascus and then take them back to Jerusalem so that they can be punished. But on the road to Damascus, on his way there, something changes. Paul meets Jesus. So he's traveling and there's this flash of bright light. Saul at the time was his name. He's blinded by that light. And then Jesus confronts him and says, why are you persecuting my church? And in that moment, Paul is completely transformed. Paul understands this mystery that he's talking to us about in this letter, that Jesus is the son of God, that he died on the cross and he rose from the dead. And in that moment, Paul is changed. He's completely transformed by the power of God. He experienced a miracle and he doesn't actually get his sight back until he gets to Damascus and he meets with a Christian church leader named Ananias and he gets his sight back. But Paul experienced the power of God and it changed everything about him. So let me ask you a question. Who has seen a miracle? All right, a lot of you didn't raise your hands, so you would think you haven't. But let me push back on that. Take a deep breath and hold it. Now let it out. You just experienced a miracle. You may not think about breathing as a miracle, but it absolutely is. When you breathe in, different parts of your nose were designed specifically by God to filter the air, to make it more clean, to warm the air in preparation for your lungs, and to humidify that air so it's ready for your lungs to deal with. 
Then when it gets to your lungs, did you know that you have over a thousand square feet of surface area in your lungs? Think about that, a thousand square feet, it's roughly the half the size of a tennis court in your lungs. So that takes in that air and it then transforms it and transfers it into your body. That thousand square feet of lung is all compressed in a space in the size of your chest. And then when your lungs fill with air, oxygen takes a ride on a protein molecule called hemoglobin, and it travels through out your body through this complex network of blood vessels. Now, if you were to take every blood vessel out of your body and cut them out and lay them end to end, now I don't recommend that. Don't do that when you get home. That's a bad idea. But if you did do that, do you know how long that would be? It would go around the earth at the equator twice. Think about that. To understand how big that is, it takes a commercial airliner four days to fly that distance. That's in-flight time. That's how long those blood vessels are. That's how complex that system is. So you experience about 23,000 miracles every single day because that's how much the average person breathes in a day. And if that's not crazy enough, one of these days I'm going to preach a sermon that involves the craziness of DNA and how complex and amazing it is. But just suffice it to say that if you took the DNA molecules out of your body and you laid them end to end, all those strands of protein, it would stretch for 67 billion miles. That's the equivalent of a trip to the moon and back 150,000 times. We are crazy complex. We are walking, talking miracles. We are a part of the mystery of God's creation power. And, and so what Paul is saying here is since we are living, walking, breathing miracles, that's a mystery of God's creation, then we should also understand the mystery of what Jesus has done for us, that we are saved by God's grace through our faith. In other words, when Jesus died on the cross, he defeated our sin. When he rose three days later, he defeated death. And when we believe that and we accept that is true, then it changes who we are. That's the mystery Paul's talking about. Look, I get that you didn't get to actually see Jesus die and rise from the dead three days later. I get you're not an eyewitness to that. But there's so many things you don't see that you believe. You can't see gravity or radio waves or oxygen or ultraviolet light. You don't doubt that they're real, even though you can't see them. You, you can't see wind, but you know it's true. And some of you are going, wait, wait, Nathan. Yeah, we don't see wind, but we see the effects of the wind. When you get home, look at yourself in the mirror. You are an effect of the mystery of God. You are a living, breathing proof that God exists. See, when you're walking on a sidewalk and you notice that there's a, a watch laying there and you pick it up, do you assume that that watch just grew somehow out of the concrete? That just naturally over time that watch came into being through some, you know, force that is not there? No, you know that watch is complex. You pick it up and you know that watch was designed by somebody. That watch was made by somebody because it's complex. You are way more complex than a watch. You were designed and made by God. If you go to Mount Rushmore, do you look at those faces and go... You know, it's really cool how the, just the random pattern of the wind and the rain has kind of shaped that where it looks exactly like American presidents. Of course you don't. You know someone made that because it's complex. And then you trust in history to tell you who made those carvings at Mount Rushmore. See, we see evidence of God in us, all around us, and in the sky above us. And then in the impacts of history, we see the effect of Jesus. We see his presence. Think about this for a minute. The calendar we use is set based on Jesus' life. When we say that it is June 4th, 2023, the only significance that has is as it relates to the approximate birth date of Jesus. How crazy is that, that this carpenter on the other side of the world had that impact so the American calendar is set by his life. His impact on the world is evidence of his life, his death, and his resurrection. And then Paul says, 
He's proclaiming this mystery, this truth, to the Gentiles. And that's us. Look at verse 13. He says, I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. So Paul is reminding them that he is in prison right now. He's saying, don't worry about me, even though I'm in house arrest in Rome, because I gladly suffer because it was worth it to preach the gospel to you. He's telling them, don't be discouraged because he's okay with where he is. But he's also reminding this church that it's not safe to be a Christian because Paul was imprisoned for preaching and teaching about Jesus. And that's a pretty good reminder for us as well. I think sometimes we get confused and we think, if I follow Jesus, everything's going to get easier and be more comfortable and convenient. But that's not true. That's not how it works. So often when we follow Jesus, it gets more difficult, not easier. Have you guys ever watched that show, Deadliest Catch? It was around for a lot of years, but it still be around. I don't even know. When it first came out, man, I loved that show because these guys would go to Alaska. They'd go out on crab boats and catch crab, and they'd get maimed and killed. It was awesome, right? I mean, that they would risk their lives so that Red Lobster can have the all-you-can-eat lobster fest. That was just amazing to me. And so you'd watch these guys that would be on this boat, and they'd be going from crab trap to crab trap, pulling traps out of the water. The whole time, the waves are beating the boat back and forth, and the wind is rocking it, and the rain is coming. And sometimes the waves would come up over the boat, have you ever seen that? And then it would literally knock the guys across the boat. It would knock these big 700-pound crab traps. They'd slide across the boat. Sometimes the Bering Sea was calm. And when that happened, the show got a little boring, and I didn't like it nearly as much. But it wouldn't be long before the Bering Sea would start kicking up again, and they'd be knocked around. And when that's going on, it's awesome to watch. But what you notice about that show is that even when the rain is driving or it's sleeting and snowing, the wind is blowing and the waves are rocking the boat, and those guys never get off task. They're on mission. That boat is on its mission, moving towards the next crab trap. And then those guys are pulling crab traps up and pulling out crab for Red Lobster. All the while, this is going on. They were on mission. And I think about the church kind of that way, that the world around us is going crazy, that there's a lot of just waves and things rocking the boat. But we never get off mission. We are focused on what we've been called to. We're focused on who we are, and we stay on mission despite the craziness of the world. You know, the world is pretty crazy right now. I mean, it's a crazy time in hu human history. People are doing wacky things. They're saying some wacky things. They're living some wacky lives. But let me let you in on a little secret. The world's always been wacky. The world's always been messed up. This isn't different. What is concerning is when those wacky ideas and those wacky things begin to infiltrate the church. And we begin to think that we're going to look more like the world around us because of what the world is doing. Let me be honest. There are a million temptations for us. Temptations that can cause us to sin in ways that destroy our families, hurt our marriages, hurt our relationship with Jesus. There's also a million distractions that aren't sin in and of themselves, but they cause us to want to trade a life of, of impact, a life of important mission for comfort and convenience. And then they become a sin because of that. We can even begin to have some of the messed up priorities of the world. We start to think like the world does. Let me give you an example of that. More and more churches are starting to focus on self-care and self-improvement. And that's where their real focus is. Rather than s love and sacrificial service. And you say, but, but hold on, Nathan. So, all right, the Bible says that I love my neighbor as myself. So, I mean, I've got to love me more before I can really love my neighbor. So I need to take some time for self-care and to focus on me. Get over yourself. We spend our whole lives taking care of ourselves. That's where most of our energy goes to. It's where our resources go to. It's where our time goes to. What we need to do is love and serve others the way Jesus has called us to. That's what we're called to. We also start to get comfortable with sin. We start to say, well, I mean, there's the sins all around us and we shouldn't expect to, the church to really look different and live different. I mean, my goodness, how are we supposed to 
not have sexual sin when every commercial, when every movie, when every TV show shows us what it looks like? How can we expect that that's not going to start infiltrating the church? Here's why. Because we are in Christ. We are God's holy people. We are called to be in the world, but not of the world. We're to live different as an example to what it looks like to be in Christ. See, we, we can't control the world around us as much as we might try. It's always going to been crazy. It always will be. And, and I think sometimes American churches, we spend way too much time <laughs> trying to control the craziness in the world around us when really what we need to do is make sure that we're on mission through that craziness. Because we can't control the world, but we can control the boat. This church is the boat, and we can stay on task and on mission. So Paul says, before we get to how we behave, how we live, he reminds us of the power, this mystery of God that we have, how we're different, and how we live out of that. Then Paul is going to wrap up this first half of the letter by telling this church that he's praying for them. And I want you to notice that this prayer isn't for Aunt Esther to get over gout and for Uncle Frederick to get over the shingles. It's a prayer that changes who we are. It's an eternal prayer. It changes how we think, how we feel about the world around us, how we relate to God, and it helps change who we are. And I can just imagine Paul on his knees when he's saying this prayer and he's, there's tears running down his face and he's desperately and passionately praying for this church that he loves. See, I, I think so often our prayers become what I call vending machine prayers. We put a prayer in and we hope to get something specific out. So we'll pray for some specific circumstance, like that we'll get over a sickness or somebody we care about will get over sickness. Or we'll pray that God relieves us from some temporary situation or inconvenience, that we've got, we need a job or we need a, something to be fixed in our family or we need our economic situation changed. And, and look, there's nothing wrong with those prayers. It's not that you're praying wrong. It's that you're not praying big enough. Because I want you to see in this prayer of Paul that this prayer of Paul is giving you something so much bigger than what we so often pray for. We have access to a love and a power that can transform who we are and then it can transform the world, transform the world around us. And, and so as I read this prayer of Paul to you, I want you to really think about the words he's saying. What, what is he praying and then compare that to your prayers. Because what I want to do is help us to learn to pray bigger. This is Ephesians 3, 14 through 21. He says, for this reason I kneel before the Father. So he's telling them, I'm on my knees. From whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with the power through his spirit in your inner being. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have the power, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. This is the prayer that we should be praying for ourselves. This is the prayer we should be praying for our family. This is the prayer we should be praying for each other as a church. Look, if your children can understand how much they're loved by God and the power they've been given through the Holy Spirit, it will change how they live. It will change how they identify. They'll start to identify in a different way. It will change how they think and how they act. If we can understand these things that Paul's praying for, like Paul, we'll become prisoners of Christ. We'll have no choice but to live the way he wants us to. Not because we read it in some book, because we want to honor and glorify him in the way that we live. See, so often we focus on behavior. And, and that's what we try to change and that's what we pray for. Like if, if only my son or my daughter can get away from that group it's a bad influence on them. If only my daughter will break up with that boy, things will get better. 
If my kids will just come back to church or they'll go to student ministry or they'll get into a Bible study, then, then things would change. But Paul is praying something way bigger than that. He is praying that we would understand the power of God. We need to be praying that the power of God would transform our kids from the inside out. Not behavior, but change in identity, who they are. We need to pray that our children's identity would flow out of a relationship with Jesus. All right, I want to break this prayer down just a little bit so we can get a little better understanding of what Paul is praying for. Paul prays for us to understand, in this church in Ephesus, to understand how big God's love is, how much we are loved by Jesus. Because if they can understand that love, then it's going to transform the way they live and the way they think. But I want us to look at the exact words he uses because I think it's very telling about what's happening. Look back at that. This is verse 17 through 19. And he says, And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. Well, that's tough. <laughs> Paul says, I want you to know this love. Then what does he say? It's beyond your ability to understand. Do you understand how difficult a passage like is for me as a preacher? Right? I've got to explain something to you that cannot be explained. Right? It, it's unfathomable in our own power. But that's why Paul's not explaining it to them. He's praying that they would have the power to understand this mystery of the love of God. It, it's bigger and deeper than we can ever imagine. And, and I kind of think about this like the ocean. Like we know the ocean is big and we know that it's deep. But we have a hard time wrapping our brains around just how deep the ocean is. Did you know that the average depth of the ocean is 2.3 miles? Think about how long it takes you to walk 2.3 miles. It's how long it would take you to walk down, which you don't want to do either, by the way. The deepest part of the ocean is seven miles deep. That's the same distance that commercial aircraft, when they're flying at maximum height, that's how high they're flying. It's almost impossible to wrap our brains around that. That's how it is with God's love. We can't really wrap our brains around it. So look, I, I could spend three hours preaching on just this passage of Scripture. I could go through every Greek word that Paul used in the original letter. You'd never come back to this church, and you still wouldn't understand the depth of God's love. Because it's not explainable. It's not understandable in our own power. So Paul is praying for the supernatural power of God to give them the understanding of how much they're loved. And then that love is what our relationship with Jesus is built on. And see, when we begin to understand the relationship that's built on that kind of love, it changes who we are. It becomes so much bigger than we think it is, right? This relationship with Jesus is more than going to church a few times a month. It's more than being in a Bible study. It's more than trying to, you know, do some things a little differently that you know aren't right. Way bigger than that. We are walking in partnership with Jesus through this life and into eternity. The Bible says that Jesus is our Lord and Savior, but it also says he's our family member. Another place, Paul says we are co-partners with Christ in this life and into eternity. That's bigger than church. It's bigger than Bible study. And, and see, if your kids can really understand how much they're loved, they can understand that. It'll change how they live. And, and if we can understand how much we're loved as a church... It'll change our priorities. It'll change the way we think about things. And that's why Paul is talking about this and praying for them in this before he moves on to talking about how we live. Because how we live flows out of this incredible love. All right, look at what Paul says next in verse 19. He says, I pray that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Look, I, I don't know what your life goals are. I don't know what your plans are for this summer and into the fall, but this ought to be right towards the top of your to-do list. Paul is saying he is praying that they have the same fullness that Christ had, the fullness of God. You know, when I die, I want people not just to remember that I was a good preacher and leader or I was a good husband and father. I want them to think those things. But I want people to know 
that I was filled with the fullness of God. I want people to look at this church and think, there's something not normal about what's going on at that Karis City Church. I can see God's hand and his power influencing that preacher. I can see his hand and his power influencing that church. That's what I want people to think because I want it to be true. That's my prayer for you. That was Paul's prayer for this church in Ephesus. You may have noticed over the last few months that our church is going pretty rapidly. We had 30% more people here in the month of May this year than we had in May last year. That's rapid growth in the church world. But can I tell you something? Who cares? Who cares? We are not called to grow a church. We are called to live in the fullness of Christ. That's what we're called to. Look, we can brag about how many people we have on Sunday mornings. We can act like we're a country club and live that out. But if we do that, we are not calling, we're not growing to the calling of God. Look, as your pastor, I'm not going to answer one day to God for how many people we had here on Sunday mornings. I'm going to answer for were we a church that was filled with God's power? Were we filled with God's presence? And did we share that power with the world around us? That's what we answer for. Is the world around us attracted to a church that's growing? No. If people are looking for a big church, they go right down the street. There's a church that has seven different locations and 30,000 people that show up on Sunday mornings. That's not what they're looking for. But if we can be a church that's filled with the fullness of God, people are going to want to be a part of that. In other words, if we love and show grace to people around us, even people that are hard to love, that's going to affect people. If we can fearlessly preach truth in love, even when it's not comfortable or convenient, people are going to want to be a part of that. That's going to change the world around us. See, it's not enough to play church where we come in on Sunday mornings and we sing a few songs and we say a couple of empty prayers and then we go right back to our regular lives. That's not what we're called to. We are called to so much more than that. Last Sunday, I was moved to tears. I was back uh, in invitation, and a young lady came back to talk to me, and she had tears running down her face, and she said, thank you for starting Kara City Church. And I said, well, of course you're welcome. And she said, no, I want to tell you what this church and what being a part of this has meant to my family. It has changed my family's relationships with God, but it's also changed my family's relationships with one another. And she said, if you had told me three years ago all the changes in my family that would happen because we started being part of Kara City, she said, I would have called you a liar. And at that point, tears started <laughs> running down my face too. Because what I know is this lady's family had been going to church for decades. They've been Christians for a long time. Something's different. My preaching did not do that. Good worship did not do that. The power of God did that. Amen. That, yeah, that's what, yeah. <laughs> See, that power that helped change your family, I can't explain it to you because I don't fully understand it. If you attend church every Sunday and, and you get involved in Bible studies and you read the Bible separately on your own and you give up some things that you think you're supposed to and start doing some things you think you're supposed to, and you don't get filled with the fullness of God, you're missing out on the life that God planned for you. He wants so much bigger for you than that. He wants to give you a peace that's beyond your ability to understand it, even when the world around you is going crazy and the storms are blowing. He wants to give you a love that's so big that it gives you comfort and you feel love even when you're all alone. He wants to give you a life that is so full that people are drawn to you and drawn to him through your life. That's what he's offering. Are you praying big enough? Are we praying big enough as a church? Then Paul concludes by praying that this church in Ephesus would experience the power of God that can't be measured. Look at what he says in verse 20. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. Here's another one. He says, you can't understand God's love in your own power. He also says, you can't even measure God's power. 
So, God again, so Paul is praying for the supernatural ability to understand this power that God gives us. Look, here's how crazy what Paul is saying is. He says that when we are in Christ, when we follow Jesus, that we have the Holy Spirit that lives in us. We have the very presence and power of God in us. That's crazy. We are literally the dwelling place of God. And and here's how to understand that. See, in the Old Testament, people didn't have the Holy Spirit. They didn't have the, the power and the presence of God with them. The power of God, the presence of God was confined to the inner part of the temple called the Holy of Holies. Or before that, it was in the tabernacle. It was also sometimes carried around on the Ark of the Covenant. Not only did they regularly not have the power of God, but if they were even just in the presence of God, what happened to them? They died. They couldn't even be in the presence of God because they were an imperfect people standing in the presence of a a perfect God. Now, on rare occasions, the power of God would infuse somebody or the Spirit of God so they could do something cool. And amazing. And we read about that in the Old Testament. But then the power would leave them and they'd no longer have that power. Then the power and presence of God came to earth in the person of Jesus Christ. And so he became the walking, talking presence of God. He was the tabernacle of God on earth. But here's what's so cool. We are now walking, talking tabernacles of God. We have that same presence and power within us. I can just imagine being in heaven one day, having a conversation with Moses. And I say, Moses, like, how awesome was it when you were in the presence of God, when you were there at the burning bush, or you were up on Mount Sinai getting the Ten Commandments? How cool was that? You know, dude, it's pretty cool. But how cool was it that you had the presence of God in you all the time? Or or maybe I'm having a conversation with Samson, and I say, Samson, how cool it is, is it that you had the power of God so that you could fight a thousand dudes with the jawbone of a donkey. How cool was that? And he goes, yeah, it was pretty cool. But you had the strength of the Holy Spirit with you all the time. As individuals and as a church, we got to make a decision. Are we going to continue to try to fuel ourselves with our own power? Or are we going to try to live in this supernatural power that's been offered to us? I, I, I so often think that we try to do things out of our own power. We try to use our own strength to accomplish things. And and so that's why Paul in this moment is reminding them of the power of God that we have before he moves to how we behave. Because if you try to behave out of your own power, you try to change how you live, you're going to fail miserably. You, You may be able to do it for a little while, but ultimately you're going to come up short because you're not living out of the power of God. That's why Paul's praying that they be reminded of this power, immeasurably more power than we can even comprehend. If we can live out of that power as individuals, then we become prisoners of Christ like Paul was. That's what Paul's saying. When you fully understand how much you're loved and the power you've been given, you become prisoner of Christ. You have no choice but to live the way he wants us to. Not because you read some rules, but because you're part of a relationship. See, we so often try to live out of our own power as individuals, but we so often try to live out of our own power as churches as well. We we try to impact the world around us with good programming or impactful teaching or a great worship. But if we don't have the power of the Holy Spirit, none of that matters. We're going to miss out on making the difference God's calling us to make. The great preacher and author A.W. Tozer said it this way, He said, if the power, I'm sorry, if the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the church today, 95% of what we do would go on and nobody would even really notice. If the Holy Spirit had been withdrawn from the New Testament church, 95% of what they did would stop and everybody would know immediately. But that shouldn't be the case in modern churches. We should be like that sailing boat out on the open ocean. When the wind dies... Wind ought to come out of our sails. We stop moving. Because we need to be fueled by the power of the Holy Spirit. And if we can do that, the wind won't stop. We live out of His strength, His power, not our own. And and, and so I've been praying this prayer of Paul over you all week long. I've been every day just praying that we would understand how much we're loved, that you would experience the fullness of God, and that you would understand His incomparable power.
And not only that, but our church staff has been praying this prayer for you this week. Our elders have been praying this prayer over you. Because we understand that if we can live like that as individuals, we'll be transformed. If we can live like that and out of that power as a church, we are going to have a dramatic impact on the world around us. Without it, we can never be the individuals we're called to be. We can never be the church we're called to be. So in just a minute, I'm going to end a little different. I'm going to ask Chris Halbach, our associate pastor. He's going to come down. Our two lay elders, Don Cloyd and Sean Horton, are going to come down. They're going to kneel at the front of the stage. And I'm going to pray this prayer of Paul over you. And they're going to be praying for you as well. And, and so I want you to do something for me. I want you to go ahead and bow your heads and close your eyes. And I want you to just imagine and let it sink in how much God loves you. To feel the power and the presence. We are praying for you that you would feel God's power. That we can carry that with us as Christians. See, if we want to truly experience the life God offers as individuals, we can't be fueled by our own power. We've got to be fueled by the Holy Spirit. And if we want to change the world around us for Jesus as a church, we can't do that with good worship services. We can only do that with the power of God. Let me pray for you guys. God, I just pray that we, are know, that we understand and know how much you love us. We know that you died. We know that you gave your life for us. But sometimes we just kind of take that for granted. It was so long ago. But God, you love us every bit as much today as you did 2,000 years ago when your son went to the cross. I just pray that I can't explain your love, I can't explain that depth, but God, that we would have the supernatural power to know we are loved. I pray for the fullness of God for each person here, that we would live our lives not just obeying some rules, not just trying to do things a certain way or going to the right studies or church, but God, that we would live a life that's full of you. God, I pray that we would also know your power. You offer us a power to be transformed, God. I just pray that we know that, we understand that, we live that. We're like the sailboat racing across the ocean at speeds we can't even imagine because of who you are, the power you've given us. God, I pray for that for each individual here. I pray for that for this church. God, we are only what we are through you. Be the wind in our sails. Be the thing that drives us as individuals. Be the things that changes us. And God, be the thing that powers this little church to change the world around us. I ask all of this in your son's name. Amen.